Here now the readings for today. <coughs> Hear a word from 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message, messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, he arose, went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, or else the journey will be too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and he went and in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken thy covenant and throw down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take my life away. He said, Go forth and stand up on the mount of the cave before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And be behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And then hear a word from the book of the prophet Isaiah from the 42nd chapter. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Yet he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. This past week, one of you sent me an email with a link uh, to a, an article that I thought was relevant enough that I eagerly followed the trail. It was a spot on WebMD with the headline, How to Handle Holiday Stress. And as you would guess, it's a list of things that smart psychologists have come up with to coach people who are feeling the weight of this time of year pressed down upon them, uh, how to deal with those emotional challenges well and kind of come into Christmas with a healthy attitude. Uh, and I spent a few minutes going through. I thought a lot of those tips made absolutely perfect sense to me. 
uh, like this one. Limit your children's, or in our case, grandchildren's, wish list to three presents. Explain to them that Jesus got three presents at his birth, and if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. <laughs> I agree, it was a bold start uh, to make that one on what. Um, and then there was this one. Give yourself permission this year not to try to seek the favor or approval of that difficult relative whom you're sure to run into and who doesn't like you all that much. Just tell yourself this year right up front that you don't need to garner his or her approval this year and consider your holiday gatherings to be B-Y-O-L-A-A. -A. Bring your own love and affection. Uh, You'll naturally feel safer, more resilient, and more at peace both with them and with yourself. So I'm thinking B-Y-O-L-A-A -A is going to be on all my, uh, my, on my heart as I go to Chris, uh, family gatherings. And then uh, this, every time you say the words, I have to, during this holiday month, ask yourself another question. Really? I just have to take that poinsettia to decorate the grave of Aunt Gladys, who lives 300 miles away and two states away, and who never really liked me all that much, and whom no one else in our family will ever go to see either. You may want to do that, or you may want, but you don't have to do it. And knowing that you have control can give you some power to take your stress level down. There were pages of this kind of advice, and I read along, I started, you know, thinking about bringing my own love and affection and limiting my shopping and changing have to's to really, do I have to? And, uh, you know, breathing more deeply. And, and uh, I, I, you know, partly I felt better, but partly as I saw the list, I'm like, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do all these stress reduction techniques. <laughs> <laughs> and I started to get a new wave of anxiety coming over me. But what did help me, I will say, as I contemplated keeping my composure through the um, holidays was this Bible reading of Elijah. Elijah going through his own high stress moments only to find God coming to him in a way he had utterly not expected. Not in some big splash dramatic way, but as the Bible calls it, the still small voice, or as some translations read it, the sound of utter silence. Isn't that a great way to think of it? God coming as the sound of utter silence and speaking to him in just the right way at a time when he needed to hear it the most. I, I took comfort. It, it, I thought about it for a minute. You know, the fact that uh, Elijah is introduced in this way, he's not at his best, is he, when we see him there in 1 Kings 19. He's cowering in the cave. He's moping. Uh, if you didn't know better, you'd think that his emotional funk was because he had, you know, things had been going badly for him. But interestingly enough, He's actually had a pretty good run of things in the lead up to 1 Kings 19. He's been on a pretty successful jaunt as a prophet. He, you remember in the lead up to this, he had this big uh, kind of theological challenge that he issues to the corrupt priests of Baal, a contest between the gods, and Elijah, Elijah's God wins this decisive victory, a great theological uh, uh, win in the competition between gods. And then right after that, uh, uh, the Israelites come to him pointing to their dire uh, circumstances uh, in the midst of a long agricultural drought and following Elijah's advice to be pen penitent and to be worshipful. Lo and behold, rain comes at just the right time. It comes in buckets and their livelihood is spared and Elijah has saved the day in that way. And then, I think maybe emboldened by those two good things, he enters the, the world of politics, where things were about as crazy back then as they uh, seem to be now, and he knocks heads with King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. He lambasts the, the, the palace for misusing power, not caring for people, and, and uh, that didn't go particularly well. Jezebel, is in, in our opening verses, you know, she, she puts a price on his head, even though Elijah... I mean, he's done all the right things as a prophet. He's maintained his in, in, integrity, but, but the, the viciousness of the royal response and we presume the death threat, that tripped it, that, that laid him low. Uh, Self-doubt crept in, and by the time we pick up the story, uh, he's 
All he can think to do is find a place to hide and hunker down and basically give up on being a prophet anymore. And that's when God comes to him. And, and you would think, given how quickly he has fallen from this high, the, the highest heights of uh, an effective prophet to, to somebody who's utterly down and depressed, you would think it would be something dramatic, a wake-up call, kind of a cheerleading pep talk. But instead, what God chooses to do is much gentler than that. You know, he simply offers Elijah an invitation. Arise and come to the mouth of the cave, Elijah. That's where he's at. C come to the mouth of the cave and look. And, and, of course, you heard what happens. When he goes to the cave's entrance and he looks out, what he sees are several iterations of strength and power unfolding around him. First comes this dramatic wind that's powerful enough that it's breaking the rocks on the side of the mountain. Then there is an earthquake. And then there is a wave of fire. But God, we are told, is not in any of those things. None of the strongest uh, uh, examples of power that the writer can, can imagine. It's only after all the dust settles and all that kind of goes away that God arrives. And he, he comes in the form of this sound of stillness, the sound of utter silence or the still small voice. And he comes, not with a command, interestingly, but with a question. So what are you doing here, Elijah? It's probably worth saying at this point, something you already know, that when it comes to power in this world, there really are two kinds of power, aren't there? I mean, there is this power of coercion, you know, the, 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 the force power, you know, like the bulldozer that, that, uh, that forces people or institutions or corporations uh, you know, to, to do exactly what they think should be done. The power where might makes right, you know, the strong overwhelms the weak. And most people in, in that day, in the day of, uh, of Elijah, they believed that that was the strongest kind of power. And it was the kind of power that God used more often than not. The power of coercion. But the story centers around a different sort of power, which is the power of influence, right? The, the, the power that's predicated on a relationship and mutual respect and not forcing your will on somebody else, but instead uh, encouraging a, a new perspective and a new way forward. It's, it's, it's not the power of command, but the power of a question. You know? What are you doing here? Have you thought about this decision you've made to give up? Is there really nothing else you can do uh, to be faithful to me. The, the power God uses at the mouth of the cave is the power that doesn't compel Elijah to do anything. It, it just invites it. It just invites it by asking a question. It's the power that opens the door but doesn't push Elijah through it, but gives him, out of respect for his own integrity and his own choice, the chance to make his own response. And I would submit to you, in some ways, it's a very early example in the Bible, this story, of the power that would come to be the, the hallmark of the coming of Christ at Christmas. Isaiah, in the Old Testament, he, he foresaw that would be the way that the, uh, the, the, the Messiah would come. He will come not high and lifted up. He'll not be the one who shouts and makes his voice heard in the street. He will come so gently. He'll come so gently, Isaiah says. A dimly burning wick he will not quench, and a bruised reed he will not break. Yet, this gentle power will faithfully bring forth justice, and the coastlands wait for his law. I love that imagery, don't you? As you think about the coming of Jesus in, this, in the face of, of all of the problems we have in this world, it is so easy to feel ineffectual, like we can't make much, it's easy to feel like a dimly burning wick or a bruised reed, fragile and not able to to affect it all very much. And to me, it's really good news to hear that that's the stuff God works with. Tiny, tiny little embers that still can be fanned to life. Small little reeds that can be woven together to make something strong uh, and to make much more of a difference than you would think. Influence as God's power. Uh, it, it does more, I think, than most of us believe. I read the, this past week a story about a man named William Barnwell, William Barnwell is a retired Episcopal priest who, in, in his retirement, instead of taking up fly fishing, decided to, to commit to spend five days a week of his retirement 
as a volunteer at Ang uh, Angola Prison in Louisiana, the maximum security prison, a notorious prison, higher, it, uh, houses uh, some of the world's, uh, the country's most violent offenders. Most people who go to Angola are there for decades at a time. And it was there that uh, Barnwell, in his retirement, decided five days a week he would show up and offer a Bible study, uh, provided they would let him do a Bible study that's different from the norm. Uh, he said, my premise is I'm not going to harangue or compel these people to change in any way. Instead, all I want to do is meet with them for Bible study and engage them in a conversation about their lives, asking them questions raised by the stories of Jesus' life. He said, all I do is we, we read the story and, and, I, and I, we talk about choices that could be made in, in, in response to, to the various characters in the story. And uh, my initial thought would be that this study would last for about 50 minutes, but it turns out the, the prisoners have so much to say and so many questions. They usually last now about four hours. And he says, it's, what's amazing is when, when I stopped trying to uh, compel these people to change and began to ask questions about themselves and, and to tell about their stories and the choices that have affected them, uh, signs of reconciliation. He says, it's amazing. You know, we have, I have some, some white men with swastika tattoos uh, sitting side by side with black men who have gang tattoos and they begin to call each other friends all because somebody just stopped and asked them to... What, what, how has your life been? What, tell us about the hurts of your life. Uh, he says prisoners are so often stunted in their ability to make good decisions because so long they've been in places, either gangs or, or prisons, where all the decisions are made for them. And so I see my little Bible study as the one way to remind them that though there's still lots in their life they can't control, even in the midst of what they can control, they're not powerless to make choices in how they respond. And lo and behold, they've discovered something in that. Uh, their, their stories matter, and they have a chance to, to not change their external circumstances, but how they respond to it. The, the power of the still, small voice, the power of influence, you never know who will be affected by that, and you never know when that power will make a difference either. On the heels of that story I saw about William Barnwell uh, came another one uh, from Minnesota. I don't know if you saw this, it was on Tuesday. It made headlines up in Minneapolis. This past Tuesday, it seems that uh, one of the uh, teams of Salvation Army bell ringers, did you see this story? Salvation Army bell ringers up at the Cub Food in suburban Minneapolis finished their shift and they took their little red kettle into the Salvation Army and uh, whoever's in charge opened the thing up and they found there a check from a local family which turned out to be the single largest donation that the kettle program has ever received in its history. Uh, the, the Minneapolis Star Tribune did an article on this and, and uh, they, they interviewed the people who were counting the money from the kettle and they, they said, we don't get a lot of checks in the kettle but we were surprised when we uh, found this one and looked at it and saw that it was made out for $500,000. Uh, they, they called the paper at, the, at this enormous gift and uh, the, the, the Minneapolis Star tracked down the local donors, uh, a, a couple who live there in the suburban Minneapolis area up in years, uh, now secure financially in their life and just uh, they, they consented to be interviewed about this. The reporter from the paper went out and it turns out they had long contemplated giving a gift of that magnitude and that type to the Salvation Army kettle program. Uh, and and uh, it turns out part of the main reason they wanted to do that was that the, the husband's grandfather had been a soldier in World War I. He was a doughboy, an infantryman in World War I. He spent time in the trenches on the Belgian-French uh, border there and uh, according to the donor family, Grandpa from World War I talked occasionally with great appreciation about the few days during his tour in Belgium when the donut lassies from the Salvation Army would come. And they would go as far as to go down in the trenches and bring uh, stale donuts and lukewarm coffee to soldiers the best they could do. He said there were more than one time when, when a, the gift of a, of a donut and coffee was the greatest gift he could ever have received. And he said, ever since then, 
uh, Grandpa talked about the, the, those donut lassies with such, uh, with such appreciation uh, and, and said, you know, it seems like a little thing, but it wasn't little to me. Uh, and, and so we decided, why not? Now's a good time to pay it forward and help the Salvation Army, who meant so much to him. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, if you would have asked me last week, last week if the positive influence of the World War I donut lassies had been exhausted, I would have said, yeah, probably so. You know what I mean? If you would have asked me last week, is there any more good that can come in this world from these women, all probably now all gone, is there any more good that can come from them crawling down in a trench in 1915 and giving a soldier a donut? I would say, no, nothing more going to happen good from that. But you know, what do I know? What do I know? When you think about it, uh, Christmas is our annual reminder of the power of gentleness and the power of influence to make an impact beyond anything we would imagine. Christmas is our annual reminder that there really is a power in the, the gentle influence God uses to win us over. And I, I think, you know, make no mistake, God really does want to win us over, and, and God will go to great lengths to do that. But what God will not do, Christmas says, is force himself on any of us. God won't try to win us over by outshouting all of the noise and the din and the distraction of the rest of the world. Christmas is our annual reminder of that. You know, God comes quietly into our hearts. And the human heart, you know, is a small space. You can't get... If your heart's already full of your own distractions, your own uh, pursuits, your own interests, there, there may not be space left to hear that still, small voice. Uh, so, that, so Christmas every year has this message, you know, you've you got to make space and you've got to listen carefully. Christmas doesn't come with earthquakes or fires or, or trumpets or banner headlines. It comes with a quiet child in a stable and the announcement gently to shepherds who are out in the fields, you know, working the third shift, you know, he, still enough to hear the voice of God speaking to them. And when you think about the person Jesus became as he grew, you know, uh, he eventually accumulated disciples, it's worth noticing, who were not particularly powerful or special themselves, you know. They, the only thing special about them was their willingness to follow that light that they saw. At, at, in the heart of Jesus, and they, they let that be fanned in their own souls to greater purposes. Everybody has it. Everybody has it, that, that chance, that ember of faith. And Advent is here, this season of birth and rebirth, so that our prayers might be that this word made flesh, mightier in weakness than any human power, will come to us and call forth in each one of us nothing less than a new creation. Amen.